It says we are live. Let's uh, let everything come through. You got it on your end? Just make sure everybody's got it good. Uh, like I threw in the comments earlier, um, if you have any questions, be thinking about them, be prepping them. Uh, today we're going to be covering, it's kind of a recap. So the last, uh, last two months we've covered air cooled and centrifugals or water cooled fairly heavily. So this month, my goal and, and what we discussed as a uh, training committee, we're going to kind of do a recap of those things. So we're going to be talking both air cooled and centrifugal. Uh, I'm going to hone in a little bit more, make it a little, a little, a little less broad spectrum. And I want to hold, I want to touch base on the critical day to day things. So, for example, we're going to spend the first bit of the class going through um, going through the loading and unloading cycles and the startup procedures on the on the chillers uh, and um, just what those parameters look like, depending on the different series. So we're going to spend some time on that. That's a very everyday thing that we're going to see all the time and really need to have some kind of perspective on. Uh, from there, I do want to talk a little bit more about some of the pull down and like and the more specialized things. I may even talk some about uh, water resets as well. Um, that's We're getting that into that time of year where chill water resets are going to be fairly heavily used. So I want to make sure that we talk about that to some degree because I don't think, right, I didn't talk about it very much the last couple of months. And then if we have time, I want to make sure we also talk a little more about uh, flow conditions inside of our barrels and how we can use approach to uh, properly look at that. All right, so we're going to dive straight into this. Uh, Air-cooled chillers, let's look at... Um, so with an air-cooled, you know, uh, the, the most simplest form in terms of a uh, compressor that we're most familiar with would be a scroll. So we're, we're very familiar with scroll compressors. Uh, and those have a very, very basic staging sequence. Uh, there is a couple of ways that they can stage. So with a, uh, a lot of times with an air-cooled chiller that scroll, you'll have two circuits going into one evaporator. Uh, most of your modern scrolls that we're going to see on a day-to-day -day are going to have a braze plate heat exchanger versus a flooded type. You know, I, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you the last time. I could tell you when we took out the last flooded type we worked on, but I couldn't tell you the last time we actually uh, had to work. Was that one flooded? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Point is, majority of them, if there are any time in the last, I don't know, five, six, ten years, they're going to be a braze plate heat exchanger of some kind. Just a quick recap on that. Uh, so a braze plate heat exchanger is literally different plates brazed together, but the plates have chambers in them. And so in the plates internally will kind of be a, a textured surface. And so your refrigerant would, you know, all this would be in a housing You'll have uh, ports in and out on one side. You'll have water uh, in and out on the other. So the water is going to be um, coming in warm, going out cold, and it would the refrigerant's going to be coming in uh, at a at a mixed state off of the metering valve, coming out as a superheated gas. So inside of this, the water and refrigerant don't mix. Just keep that in mind. The refrigerant is going to be in one set of chambers and the water is going to be blended in the other set of chambers. And so what this allows it to do is because these are kind of ruffled internally, they, it allows for really good heat exchange and we can transfer, you know, the, the warm or we can remove the heat from the water to get it back to our set point and then take it out through the refrigerant through a superheated vapor. That is the basic recap of a braze plate. This is what you will most commonly see with a scroll system. Uh, and I don't even think I've seen a screw with a braze plate. Now that I think about it, have I? Yes, no, 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 I don't think I have. If somebody has, uh, point that out. I'm actually kind of curious about that now that I bring it up. Are they producing 
uh, brace plate screws. I, if I don't, I don't, I haven't seen one actually. I don't know of one. Anyway, in terms of staging, all right. So well, we have a set point. We're going to say it's 45 degrees leaving chill water. We have an air cooled chiller that has scroll compressors. It'll have two circuits at minimum. That's those two circuits could have as few as two compressors per circuit. They could have as many as six or eight compressors per circuit. Um, there's two ways that that system can stage those compressors. It can either bring on compressor one and compressor one. So it'd be one A and one B for circuit one and circuit two. And it's going to load that evaporator up together simultaneously, or it could load all of circuit one. And so circuit one to circuit two would be lead lag to one another. So what that would mean is circuit one is going to completely stage up. You say it has four compressors. All four compressors are going to load. And when circuit one maxes out, then it's going to bring circuit two to support circuit one. When it does that, all those compressors on circuit one are going to stay staged up. You're not going to turn any off to start turning them on on circuit two. It's just circuit two is going to then come in and start staging up. Now, the, I think the most common that you're going to see is the two are going to stage together. And so you'll have circuit one, compressor one, circuit two, compressor two, and it's going to um, cycle those compressors up one by one uh, in, in sequence with each other. So it depends, all, all that kind of gets set up at the time of commissioning and how they, uh, how they want that chiller to run, whether they want it to be a true lead lag system or a, what would be known as a, as a balanced load would be the, the alternative commissioning. So that happens at that phase. And, and you should be able to look at the sales order. Uh, sales orders are extremely useful, especially when you're having some issues with, that are very, say, prolonged with any kind of chiller. Uh, if, if they've had you know, years worth of problems, everybody's had tr trouble figuring it out. One of the first things that I do is I, I may try to get that sales order or I look at what the initial design spec was and then try to get everything back to that specification because that was the starting point that everything was intended to be at. And one of the things I find is those systems, the chiller and the plant both tend to ha start to swing very far and just over time get further and further and further from what they were designed to run at originally. And the further you get from that, the worse it's going to run. So anyway, uh, look at that. This would be a scroll. Uh, they're really, if you understand multi-circuit RTU, you can understand multi-circuit scroll chiller. They're not that much different. Uh, so don't let that get in your head just because it has the, the term chiller behind it. Now, where this gets more complicated, we're going to get into screw loading. Uh, so with screws, you can have uh, a couple of different ways, depending on the circuit type. You will, at this point, I think most manufacturers are switching to a flooded type evaporator. Uh, there are still plenty of older screw uh, air cools out there that have DX. Quick recap on that. If you're not familiar with those two terms, it depends on where the refrigerant is located inside of the vessel. So most of your screws are going to have a shell and tube heat exchanger of some kind. That's the one where you've got this big circular cylinder in the chiller and it'll have an end plate on either end or an end cap. And on one end, you'll have a set of piping coming in and out. And then on the sides of it, you'll have additional piping. Now, uh, depending on the type, so if it is a DX heat exchanger uh, or shell and tube, refrigerant is uh, inside the tubes. 
It's really is, that's all it is. Refrigerants inside the tubes. You know which two tu- you know which ones go into the tubes by the end plate. So if your um, your end plate ports, so these here, these feed the tubes. The side mounts are feeding the shell. So these feed shell. Um, Now, if you haven't put it together yet, the inverse of DX, which we've referred to as flooded, refrigerant, that's, I'm not even going to try to pronounce what that was about to spell. Refrigerant is uh, outside tubes. That's the difference. And just an absolute bare bones nutshell. Um, Which would mean that the, the refrigerant is coming into these ports and the water is on the end feeding into the tubes uh, in a flooded style. Most of your modern machines are being produced as flooded style because of the efficiency. They are more efficient and uh, they run a lower approach value, which ultimately means they have better heat exchange. They also require a lot more refrigerant, which is one of the benefits of a DX is you're not trying to fill this entire cavity you're only filling the inside of the tubes, which is not near as much volume. Uh, now they are working and they've developed ways of uh, redesigning how the flooded, like basically how much refrigerant. So for example, a more traditional or old school uh, flooded EVAP may have a liquid refrigerant level, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50% of the of the barrel so somewhere between here would be the upper line and all this down would be liquid refrigerant you'll notice on a lot of the newer style uh i think a yvaa would be a prime example of this uh they actually would run a much lower refrigerant level i mean it's down here just inches off the bottom and so they've just they've designed it to where it's, it's still technically a flooded type heat exchanger, but it requires less refrigerant. So the drawback of the refrigerant charge required is reduced, if not eliminated completely, by the, those more modern, more efficient designs. And our ability to get better uh, surface area on the tubing and machine the copper that's in there better has really helped us uh, create better heat exchange without full submersion. What I mean by full submersion is one of the goals of a flooded heat exchanger is to completely submerge all of the, the tubes inside of there so that you have full surface contact and you can exchange heat appropriately. If you think back to last month when we were talking about the YK centrifugal, you have what's known as a um, the hybrid or the falling film heat exchanger. That is one where we're actually uh, raining liquid droplets down over the tubes, and uh, we're creating uh, or we're getting the same cooling effect with less refrigerant with a falling film style. And if I'm not mistaken, um, I don't think. No, the YVAA, if I remember correctly, feeds into the bottom. It does not feed into the top. I don't think they implemented a hybrid style. I don't believe. Either way, that's not what matters here. The point is, this is the type of heat exchanger we're looking at with a screw machine. Now, screws can still have multiple compressors in one circuit. So you can still run... Uh, say two screws on circuit one and and one screw or two screws on circuit two. So you can have still a total of four screw compressors per chiller, two per circuit. Now, one of the things that makes um, a screw different is we stage it much differently. 
So with a scroll, we stage up by turning on compressors and, and now we have, you know, 3D and variable speed scrolls. So one of the things that that does um, is it allows you to, uh, um, allows you to modulate how much flow that that, that scroll is going to generate. And so we can, we have more control without having to just turn compressors on and off because at one time, that's the only way we had to stage a scroll machine was you needed more cooling, turn more, com turn more compressors on. Less cooling, turn them off. Very uh, archaic, I guess. We do have a question from one of the guys uh, with the falling feed. Is it is evaporating as it hits the water tube? Yes, with the falling film, uh, as the as the refrigerant rains down, it uh, it is evaporating off as it comes into contact, and so there'll be the, there would be like a header up top here, uh, and that header so the, our liquid refrigerant coming from the can, the the liquid line and the metering valve would feed in the top. And, uh, you know, we get sprayed across this rail into uh, the, the evaporator and, and literally sprayed uh, into uh, or across those tubes. And as it goes down, evaporates, cooling effect happens. Uh, so I got you. All right. So. With a screw, when we go to stage up, obviously we need to turn a compressor on. So compressor goes to turn on. It should be starting at minimum. Now there's two ways that we still do this in the industry. The more common way is we do it through a slide valve. So uh, I talked pretty heavily about screws. I'm not gonna go through a complete thing again, but we have a slide valve in there. That slide valve allows us to control how much um, how much of these screw bolts have uh, closed. So we literally uh, we're, we're, we're sliding this this uh, this cylinder back and forth and we're opening up um, the length that the screws can compress in. So if they're, if they're a 12 inch screw bolt, for example, we can move the slide this way and turn those 12 inches of compression into eight inches of compression, which means we move less volume. And that is how we load and unload a screw compressor is we're moving that slide on a slide system uh, to increase or decrease the length of the bolts creating compression. So we can do that either via, um, well, a lot of times we do it through the oil system. We're able to redirect the oil system and fire different solenoid coils to apply um, oil pressure to push that slide one way or the other. Uh, some of the more older systems, uh, I think York's the one that comes to mind offhand, they had a, a spring-loaded uh, slide. And so you would, it would, the spring would push the slide to full unload. And then as the compressor ran and built up oil pressure and everything happened, it had a, a, a load control valve that would direct oil at a certain rate into the slide assembly and would compress that spring and push that slide so that it would increase the load or make the bolts longer, you know, figuratively, um, so that we can pump more refrigerant. So that was that was a fairly old design. I that's that's the only one I'm aware of that used a spring. So like handbell, any of your newer ish, newer as in what two thousand and above trains. Uh, you know, and, and uh, they, from there, York started going to straight variable speed. I think they, they got away from their slide system and, and committed to the variable speed side somewhere in there. Anyway, um, so yes, slides. As we start up, let's say our input water 
is 55. So we have 55 circling through our loop. We want 45. So that screw compressor is going to turn on and it's going to run at minimum load, which we calculate by RLA. So our RLA with the slide in the full unload position may be 40%. It's pretty common. So at 40%, that chill water output, the leaving chill water, is going to cool down, let's say, 5 degrees. So we're going to go from 55 to 50 leaving, and we're just going to hover there. So that means that we are still 5 degrees from set point. We, and to continue increasing, we need to achieve that. We're going to slide that slide uh, further in to move more refrigerant, which allows us to uh, chill the water more. So let's say we go from 40% uh, and we slowly, over a period of time, you know, we're talking 10, 20 minutes, we, we slowly bump that uh, screw up. And let's say we get it to 100% RLA. Uh, at 100% RLA, we are still only cooling the water 8 degrees. We're still 2 degrees from set point. Okay? Um, notice I was very specific with how I said that. I said 100% RLA. I did not say 100% slide. A lot of the time, we won't actually move that slide to a 100% position. So RLA is relative to the, the compression we're creating. So for example, if you're having head pressure issues because you have condenser fans that are down, or you don't have proper flow on the evaporator, or you've got dirty coils, go down the list. Um, those things will increase compression ratio, which higher compression ratio means higher RLA is required to push that refrigerant. So if you're having an issue with that, Make sure all your fans are working, make sure your coils are clean, and make sure your GPM through your evaporator is good. If all of those things check out, then you've gotten the most out of that compressor you're going to get. But we base a, compre a screw compressor's load. We do the same thing for a centrifugal, by the way. This is centrifugal or screw. We base their, their load percentage off of the RLA of that compressor not the position of the slide or the inlet guide vanes or PRV, if you're talking centrifugal, which we'll get there. Um, all right, so we're at 100% RLA with one compressor, and uh, we've got, we've, we've won't, we still have two degrees to go to achieve set point. Depending on the machine, let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say we had one compressor per circuit. We had two circuits. At that point, we would then bring in, we would leave circuit one alone, and we're going to bring in circuit two, and it's going to start to stage up as well. And it's going to start to load and try to catch up with circuit one. And then that will go through the exact same staging sequence. it would be no different until we achieve our 45 degree leaving water. And then at that point, once we hit it and we start to go past it, then we're gonna start sliding the slide the other way and taking load off of the compressors until we can uh, find that sweet spot where we can just hover at 45 degree leaving and never move. Because that is the ultimate goal. Um, then at that point, let's say, okay, we go through the day like that. We get to that evening, outside air temperature drops. Our entering water now goes from 55 to 50. Well, we no longer running both compressor one and two 
at minimum load, which means 40% RLA, those slide valves have slid as much as they can. We're still overcooling, meaning that we're doing 44 degrees leaving. It's still too much. We still want 45. At that point, with both compressors at minimum, then we will turn off compressor two. And compressor one will then st start to slowly stage back up by sliding the slide until we can then maintain our leaving water that we desire, 45 degrees. Keep in mind, during this time and during all of this staging, and you're gonna hear the compressors making lots of noise, uh, you're gonna see that water shoot way up sometimes above set point. You know, say we were a below set point or we were trying to get down to set point, we max the compressor out, we need to load up another compressor. Well, then we go to bring that one in and uh, all of a sudden, because of the loading cycle, we see that our leaving water spikes several degrees suddenly. It's okay. The compressors are loading. Those slides are moving and doing what they need to. It will recover and it's going to come back to where it needs. Don't let that freak you out. Nothing is wrong. This is especially true. This is kind of a segue into variable speed uh, screws. This is especially true because variable speed screws are very noisy in my opinion, more noisy than just a regular screw with a slide because of the drive harmonics on them. Regardless, uh, they will ramp down. And you'll, if you're not familiar with it, you'll think you just caused the world to crash. In reality, you're, you're about to bring in more, com more compressors. Okay, so let's transition gears. Now we're looking at a... Everything else is the same in the machine except the compressor is now a variable speed compressor. With a variable speed compressor, you're not going to have a slide. We're going to ramp the compressor motor hertz to match our load and to increase or decrease. So we, we are compressing against the entire length. You know, if we have a 12 inch bolts, we're using all 12 inches, but we're either running at, uh, now it'll show on your display as either, you know, if we're talking York specifically, 50 hertz up to 200 hertz. Okay. Now, if you look at the motor tag, it's going to say a 60 hertz motor, and that is correct. We're, if you're in the computer world at all, overclocking the motor. We're ramping it past its rated 60 hertz to achieve this speed, the RPM that we're seeking. Okay, so uh, with that, compressor comes on, it's going to run at minimum 50 hertz. And you're going to have the very similar conditions, okay? So we have 55 degree water coming in. We, we want to see 45 going out. We bring compressor one in at 50 hertz. Compressor one is going to slowly increase in, in the speed until it hits 200 hertz. We're very specifically talking about York at the moment, but this the principle applies across the board. So we hit 200 hertz. Uh, once we hit that, it's gonna sit there for a minute and it's, the algorithm wants to see, okay, what's my leaving water gonna do? All right, at 200 hertz, we're only cooling by eight degrees, which means we're doing 47 degree water, not 45, we still need more. A, a variable speed machine, instead of sliding the slide to unload, we're then gonna, you're gonna hear that compressor ramp down because it wants to come to a starting speed for the other compressor. Most, especially with York, they're built into the same drive. So you, they, they end up running in perfect unison with each other. So, um, Specifically, like a York YCIV is going to bring that compressor down, not to 50 hertz, to 100 hertz. And you're just going to hit that 100 hertz mark, which is going to be the speed to bring in compressor 2. And the compressor 1 and 2 will then go from 100 hertz and make their way back up to the 200 mark. Now, in reality, we only needed two more degrees. So we probably won't ever get there. 
where we where one compressor at 200 hertz was only doing eight degrees two compressors at 150 hertz is able to hit our 10 degrees and give us 45 degree leaving water and then we will we will modulate that speed up and down on both compressors to maintain that 45 leaving uh, if okay so let's say we have a similar condition we no longer have the load that we had we need to stage down in this very same way we staged up we stage down compressor is going to run as low as it can once they get to a minimum hertz they're going to stop unloading and if we still continue to cool past set point so we hit 44 degrees for example it's just going to turn off that one it doesn't need and then the one it does need is going to slowly speed it back up until it reaches set point and able to maintain those that is a, a your between whether it be variable speed or slide that is your basic control sequence for how we load and unload that machine and all the noises it makes these things are loud and they are intimidating if you haven't if you're not familiar with them genuinely they're not that bad once you get to know them and you get familiar and comfortable with the concept of what that compressor is doing and why that chiller is doing it it's not that bad honestly screws are fairly easy troubleshoots most of the time they're very robust compressors across the board i mean they just they work really well. There's a reason the industry has shifted so heavily to them and why they favor them so much. I'm a big fan of a screw design. I think they're wonderful, wonderful compressors. Anyway, if there's any questions on this side of it, ask them now. Otherwise, we're going to move into uh, the water cooled side or centrifugal specifically. Yeah. All right. Moving on. With a centrifugal, I'm not going to go into water cooled screw. You know, the, that principle applies to what we're talking about loading, unloading the same for that screw machine. So we're going to hone in specifically on centrifugal loading and unloading. All right. So with a centrifugal, we have uh, our, our biggest component is the inlet guide vanes, IGV or PRV if you're talking York terms. Uh, PRV is a pre-rotation vein, and that is a very accurate term, and I'll explain more why. Uh, but if you are not familiar with what that is, or just to give a general recap, either way you want to look at it, So we have in the compressor, we have our housing, we have our volute, all right, this is where our impeller sits, do 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 do, art class with Holden, and right here you'll have your uh, guide vanes. Okay, this is this is sitting on top of the chiller barrel. You've got a suction elbow coming off from here, feeding refrigerant into it. Around the circle we go. Inside there, if you're looking straight this way into the nose of it, so say the suction elbow wasn't there, you would see. Uh, the guide vanes would have a triangular shape through there, very similar to this. And those vanes are nothing more than triangular paddles that rotate in order to allow more refrigerant through or less. Um, so as the... Uh, as the refrigerant passes, we, or so uh, let me back up. All right, 
So let's take a similar approach. We have a centrifugal. Now we're talking just a constant speed centrifugal. We're not talking variable. That's another, another step to the sequence. So we're, I'm going to first hone in on constant speed. All right. We have the chiller. We want to achieve 45. We have 55 coming in. There's only one compressor. Well, <laughs> there can be more than one. Let me say that now. They, the, they do produce them with, uh, I think, as many as for sure two. Uh, they, have, they can have two compressor systems. I think I've seen them as many as four, like in real specific case. Now, we're talking uh, full-blown um, uh, centrifugals. Now, if you're talking turbo core type style, uh, those can have uh, more than that. I think they can have four or five. They can have several. That's the, but those are more custom builds. Anyway, the um, refrigerant coming in, we want to achieve 45 degrees water going out. So this machine, in order to turn on, has to have the guide vanes in full closed. If those guide vanes are not closed and they're not sealing properly against each other, so with York, they actually overlap, and I think carriers do as well. They, they have an overlap with each other, and they tell you, if you can fold a dollar bill four times and flatten it, and, and it will fit between the guide vanes with them in the closed position, it's very likely that compressor won't be able to start without an overcurrent. And that's exactly the reason why we, we have to have them closed is if too much refrigerant is allowed to get through, it requires so much torque and force to spin that impeller that we need the minimum possible load we can create to, cre to generate that rotation. Okay? Um, train does not overlap. There's butt up very tightly. So the trains have a very tight fit where they just butt into each other side by side. Anyway, okay. So we're tur we've, we've turned on. Compressor is running. The IGV is in the zero position. We're fully closed. Um, we're going to start to, we are going to start to have some cooling happen, even with these closed. You're going to see, it's not that absolutely no refrigerant can flow with them closed, but it is just very, very, um, uh, it's very minimal. Okay. So we go from, say, f it's, uh, uh, we get, we're able to cool down to, you know, three by three degrees. So we're, we're able to push out 52 leaving with them closed. Okay. Um, at this point, we need more load. And our RLA is only running, say, at 50%. Okay. In the same way I said we control uh, our load capacity is based off of RLA, the same thing applies here. So our motor RLA is at 50%, we're fully closed, and we have 52 leaving with a 45 set point. Then we're gonna start to slowly pivot those veins open in order to allow more refrigerant to flow through. As we do that, the control system is monitoring the RLA of the compressor, and it's making sure that it doesn't exceed a set value. And it's also monitoring um, the leaving water temperature. And it wants to achieve that 45 degrees. So it's just going to continuously slowly open until it reaches its set point. That could be 20, 30% IGV on a normal centrifugal. We're not talking turbo core at this point. Those are variable speed. <laughs> That's a whole nother animal. We'll get there. Um, so the same thing where I said earlier, 100% loaded doesn't mean um, the slide valve on a screw is fully open. 
is same a principle 100% loaded compressor on a centrifugal doesn't mean 100% IGV. Okay, so for example, if we had um, if we had a high pull down for some reason, so I'm going to shift gears a little here. Let's say we had 65 degrees coming into our chiller uh, on the chill water side. Then it's possible that we could have a hard, it, it, or not possible, it's going to run a higher RLA because we're having to move more heat. So as it's trying to pull that loop down, the guide vane position at that might only be 20% um, in order to maintain RLA and let that compressor pull down. Now keep in mind, as we're moving all that extra heat over we're, we're, that means your high side, your condenser side, is also going to track with that. So unless you have just rock star cooling towers, most of the time, uh, especially during a pull down, uh, you're going to see um, that cooling tower water may struggle a little while you're getting the loop down to temperature until things can stabilize. And that's okay. It's very common for towers, especially in our market. Industrial side, I think they give a lot more, you know, leeway and not quite as tightly uh, designed, but on the commercial side, absolutely, every penny they can save. So, um, yes, we get down to where our entering is 55 and we start to get to our 45 degrees leaving water. We may see that our RLA is dropping as we go and we're able to open those veins more, or it's, depending on your situation, it may be just the opposite. Because of the load and the pull down, and as we separate temperature, so the, the evaporator gets colder, we're putting a lot of heat into the condenser and it's climbing, we may see that our, our because our compression ratio is increasing, because our two barrels are getting further apart in pressure, we have to close those guide veins instead. So maybe instead of going from 20%, we have to go to 15% in order to not go above our 100% RLA set point for safety, but still try to achieve the chill water set point. Um, The closer, as, so that's our loading up sequence. It's the same basic theory coming back down, okay? Say we start to overshoot our chill water set point of 45, then we can just close those guide vanes off and try to back that machine to where we can hone in at that 45 leaving and, and never leave that point, even if our entering water begins to drop. Now for a centrifugal, um, it, it, really for any machine, but especially for centrifugals, they do not like to shut down and they should not cycle uh, unless absolutely necessary. So part of our goal when we're in that plant is to help guide the building to a set of configurations and parameters that prevents that machine from having to cycle on load as much as possible. Uh, that being said, we will get to some conditions where uh, we've backed that compressor off as much as it possibly can and it will begin to uh, cycle on leaving water. So that does happen. It's genuinely not a good thing. Doesn't mean the end of the world, but if you find a plant that's working that way, I would highly recommend that we evaluate the, how that plant is configured 
and what we could recommend to the customer to get them either longer run times or uh, less time with low load running. Because that's that is the alternative. Is you know if we can't if we don't have enough load to keep the machine on, then we need to find a way to run the building without the machine. Some plants have economizers to do this using the condenser water and the cooling tower as a chiller. Uh, that's one method. Um, a lot of buildings, you know, they they are designed from the beginning with a uh, free cooling mode. Same exact thing an RTU would do. Uh, it just converts to 100% outside air because it's cold enough outside and it cools the building that way. And the mechanical cooling can shut down at that point. It's not needed. So there are options on how we can recommend the customer utilize what they have. Uh, another thing I find is that a lot of buildings have those types of things built into them. But due to... Um, due to lack of understanding or whatever, just for whatever reasons, somewhere along the way, somebody decided those things weren't needed and they get turned off. And that is one of those little things that it's, it's one step to a system running less efficient and 10 steps further down the road, hardly anything functions properly. So then you have to backtrack all those little things that got changed along the way to get to the source of the original problem. Uh, let's see, Jason, how much can flow play a part in what you're talking about in terms of uh, loading and unloading? Flow plays a major part. Uh, maybe I should talk about that now. Uh, I think... Uh, a, I could get into pull down. I think flow is something that gets a lot of people. Um, and I've, I've, uh, the biggest, the biggest thing that's going to help you when you're starting to look at any chiller and its ability to, or how efficient it is being is going to be your approaches and what the design approach is for that system versus actual approach. So a flooded barrel, most of the time, those are designed to run no more than three degrees of approach. If you see more than that, then you need to look into what's going on. On the contrary, a DX system is designed to run typically around 10 degrees. And the more, the further, the less approach you have, the more efficient your heat exchange you're achieving. You want that number to be as low as you can possibly make it while still maintaining uh, uh, operation. I'll give an example of this. Uh, was, I was doing a balancing. I did not have the sales order data or anything else, but I had a, as a RTAA, air-cooled chiller, uh, and it was a DX barrel and they had the water, the chill water valves wide open. And we had a approach of, I think it was 14 or 15 degrees. And the system was having some, uh, it was having alarms. I'm forgetting now what they were regardless. When I got to looking into, looking into it, uh, that's when I noticed that the valves were wide open. There was no balancing done. And I was able to confirm that the sensors were reading properly uh, on, on the machine. Uh, we, we were reading uh, accurate, so our approach value would be accurate. Our water temp sensors were within range. Our saturation sensors were within range. Everything was there. An approach is factored by, I didn't bring that up. So your approach is the difference between your saturation on that heat exchanger and you're leaving water. So it, that's, that's the formula anytime I bring that up. So in this particular case, uh, I went over to the leaving water valve and I began to slowly crank it down until I got uh, 
until I got that approach value as low as it would go. And that chiller went from really struggling. It had low pressure issues. Like it, was, it was on the edge of tripping low pressure constantly. And it, it would randomly do that. And we're talking, this, this is the middle of summer. We should have no problem creating load. The building would run very hot. We had a very low deferential across the barrel. We would have, you know, 60 degrees coming in and we were struggling to produce 50 degrees going out. And it, it, was, it was all revolving around this flow. So as I reduced the GPM, uh, it allowed the heat exchange to improve and our high flow condition went away. Our approach went from, uh, I think it was 14, and I got it down to five, which for a DX is incredible. That's a really good solid number if, if you can get it that far. Now, the mistake I made, which you have to be careful with, uh, you can go too far. And that's what I did in this particular case. I made it great for the chiller. The chiller had wonderful heat exchange. But I took it so far that we got a call back the day, the next day. Uh, the building lost too much GPM. And so while we were, the chiller was rocking it, uh, the building couldn't maintain. And what that, what that needed was just increase the flow a little bit, which we had room to do on the chiller. We could sacrifice a little bit of efficiency on the chiller and get the, um, get the building GPM high enough to maintain the chill water coils inside, which is what we did. Again, I didn't have, um, oh, the, the, the Delta T on that. So we went from, uh, we went from barely being able to produce 50 degree water to where, uh, and that's with that circuit staged up almost 100%. Uh, to the circuit running somewhere around 60%. Uh, and, and we hit our 45 degree set point with that five degrees of approach. Now, after everything settled out and was done, that final approach landed at around, uh, I think, somewhere between seven or eight degrees, which is still perfectly fine as far as I'm concerned for DX. And we didn't need to run the compressor, you know, any more than 60, 60 to 70 percent in order to maintain set point. This the one circuit on this machine was more than enough to run that building. And so you have one machine with two circuits, not because you need two circuits to maintain load. The second circuit is legit redundancy. That way, if circuit one had gone down, which in this particular case was the case, circuit two was down on this machine. We only had circuit one, so circuit one tripping was a big deal because uh, we were still doing repairs on circuit two. So we don't, we don't even need all of, all of circuit one to maintain our, uh, our, our chill water set point. Anyway, that, so that ended up being the final, uh, uh, the final resolution on that was was uh, we got down to our um, 45 set point and then our actual delta maintained um, somewhere between seven or eight degrees as well. We were floating on the lower end. Sometimes it dipped down to 50 and then sometimes it'd go up a couple of degrees above 50 once we got our leaving chill water satisfied. And I just think about how inefficient that system was running, you know, with that with that condition. Uh, I do see a question here. Answer. Explain superheat and why it's important. Yes, superheat is critical. That's getting into more of the refrigerant side. Uh, ultimately, the, the simple answer is superheat is what is protecting the compressor from damage from liquid refrigerant okay if you allow too low of a superheat or no superheat at all then you get into liquid refrigerant territory where the all the liquid did not boil off um screws do not take kindly to liquid at all uh they they're a scroll you can pound with liquid all day and while it may not be happy with you it won't divorce you right 
You, you didn't. You could just. You could chunk a lot at a scroll. Screws you can beat pretty heavily, and they'll keep going, but they'll eventually walk away. Screws not going to take that very kindly. Um, and most of the time, what'll happen is you put so much bearing stress because it's trying to compress a liquid somewhere it's not meant to be that it forces the bolts apart so fiercely that it causes the races to bind up and eventually you just lock the bearings. And that, that's, that's, that's a very common result to a severe flooding condition with a screw uh, if you don't burn the motor out first. Now a centrifugal, if you get too low, and now you're thinking, okay, so when you're standing in, in front of a centrifugal, the compressors on top, our suction elbows up here, um, you know, you think in your mind, okay, theoretically, I've typically got a couple of feet in most centrifugals at minimum where this is nothing but vapor. Our liquid never actually, I don't even know that there's enough liquid in the liquid refrigerant in the machine to get to completely fill the evaporator enough to literally push liquid into that compressor. I don't think they hold that much refrigerant. But that doesn't mean that it can't, uh, um, that it can't have a, a flooding state or it gets too low of a superheat. Because what ends up happening is when, when the uh, suction gas doesn't superheat enough you have these little droplets that get pulled off and they they're they may be literally the size of a bb and those bbs look like you fired a buckshot off into that impeller a bird shot so if you ever uh, see an impeller that just it literally looks like somebody stood there with a 12 gauge and just blasted right off into the middle of it that's because that system had too low of a superheat there was something happening in that evaporator, whether it be overcharge, whether it be not enough, not proper heat exchange, whether it be overfeeding from the metering device, there's a number of things that could have caused that. Um, but you can have the same result nonetheless, is my point. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question there. Um, see for YVAA, what was if zero reading at 50% compressor running level in liquid level sensor? Well, if your liquid level sensor is at 0% with a 50% compressor, I mean, you just, you may have some kind of charge issue ultimately. Uh, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's not enough information, but you know, you ought to have something on the liquid level. Oh wait, I'm sorry. YVAA, uh, YVAAs naturally run. I forget what the parameter is, but they have a very low um, liquid level, Com especially like if you're used to a YCIV that actually maintains a moderate level of liquid, somewhere between, uh, what is it, like 8 and 20%, and it can get even higher than that. Anyway, uh, YVAAs run much lower. They don't, they don't hold that much, um, largely because we don't have a drain valve. You don't have a drain valve with a YVAA. You do with a YCIV, so it's able to back up more refrigerant into the flash tank. Uh, you see, hurt, okay. So you turn down compressor hertz and turn up GPM in order to maintain the chill water loop. No. No, your GPM should remain constant through that chiller as much as possible. You do not want that water to fluctuate. And so you have loops out there that have variable speed pumps in them. But that is a system that may be, um, whether it be a two-pipe system with a bypass or, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a handful of configurations where, the total GPM on the loop can vary. And theoretically, you can vary the actual GPM through the chiller, but all of that would be based on building load. So um, that's 
what you have to be uh, careful with. Uh, how to measure your GPM. So there's formulas on measuring GPM, um, but uh, uh, my personal preference is I'll, I'll pull up the, the manual for that chiller and I'll look at the flow charts and the IOM and you can take a, a pressure drop at that point and see what the uh, so the pressure drop would be the inlet outlet water uh, pressure and you should have a set differential. So the higher that differential is, the higher the flow through the machine and the lower the differential, the less flow you have. Uh, there aren't, I'm not gonna tell you there's rules of thumbs in that. Um, there are some patterns you will see. So you, know, you may walk up to one and you might see, uh, uh, you know, a, a three PSI drop and you walk up to another one, it'd be 10 or 15 PSI across that heat exchanger. So you definitely need, uh, like I said, that you need the design data for what that chiller was meant to run at. At the same time, um, uh, you need to, uh, um, if you don't have that or just at worst case scenario, if you, if you can't get the design data, you can at minimum see what your GPM value is and try to balance what you need to from there based off of the generic flow chart for the pressure drop for that machine, which does, what's challenging to that is it does the, depending on the style of evaporator and the design of it can impact that chart. So you have to be, you, you have to be very careful. You're in a little bit of dangerous territory. Apologize guys. Let me, I need to respond to this really quickly. Um, Okay. Uh, all right. Back to the flow. Uh, so if you have, from a general stance, you, if you have perfect flow, then your approach values, let's say the refrigerant charge and refrigerant circuit and all that is functioning, um, uh, is not functioning as it needs to. So the uh, refrigerant circuit is, is functioning just as it needs to. So at that point, you would, you start having issues with, okay, do we have too little flow or too much flow? And you can have both, all right? Just like I was talking about earlier in that, uh, that RTA, RTAA example, we had too much flow. It was inhibiting, it was, it was creating two conditions. One, you do not have proper heat transfer when you have too much flow. And two, you, um, uh, they gum it. The second one is you're not going to achieve, you're going to struggle to achieve your leaving water set point because of heat transfer. And a lot of it just comes down to heat transfer in general. So with too much flow, that water is moving so quickly through that heat exchanger that it, its physical contact time is cut down too far. So it's not spending enough time making physical contact. Uh, and you should always have, a, you know, a turbulent flow through that heat exchanger uh, by any modern designs that we use today. You should have turbulence. You want turbulence mixing with that in that water going through the tube so that that water is constantly making contact with the outer walls of the, uh, the tubing. And that's, that's an issue you have whenever that turbulence is not there. You're not cycling that water so the water that's in the middle of the tube may not ever make physical contact with the outer edges of the sidewall 
which means it's not going to transfer efficiently. And what can happen is you can put so much force and pressure behind that, that water that you the, the turbulence turns into uh, what, what would be known as a laminar effect. Uh, what that does is the water around the edges of the tubing doesn't actually cycle and flow and mix with the rest of the water properly because there's so much physical force behind it and that inhibits heat transfer. So in an evaporator, that's going to give you low saturations and high approach values. And it's also going to mean that the, you're going to struggle to achieve your leaving water set point. And, and the inverse can happen if you have too much flow on your condenser, you're going to create a, the same condition and the refrigerant isn't able to transfer the heat properly into the, ref, into the water. And so that's going to allow heat to stack in the condenser and eventually it's going to lead to head pressure issues because again you're flowing too much water you have to back that off there there is a balance there uh, in the same way i think too little water makes a lot of sense it's the same thing as too little airflow through a regular coil we understand that you're going to have saturation issues um, you're also going to have super low approach values so that's one of the things you can look at um, for if you're, if you're questioning too little flow, then your approach value is going to be very low. Um, whereas too much flow is going to increase your approach. Uh, Just trying to think. Uh, yeah, if there if there's anything, you know, when I walk into a plant and I start trying to evaluate its overall condition, efficiency, how well that just everything is is functioning. Some of the first numbers I look at is my approach values on my heat exchanger, whether that be condenser or evaporator. That's as one of the very first readings that I check. And that helps guide me to flow issues. And, and a very commonly, uh, most of the issues you have with the chiller, especially water-cooled centrifugals, majority of the time have nothing to do with the chiller itself. Now, they obviously have failures and yada, yada, yada. But my point is, a lot of those service calls you're going to run aren't actually the troubleshoot components on the chiller. It's some external factor has happened, uh, whether that be through balancing issues, whether that be through pump issues, um, some kind of temperature control problem, you know, just there, there's a, a myriad of things that happens that are external to the chiller to cause that. Okay. Uh, something I didn't talk about with centrifugal loading and unloading is, uh, okay, so let's say you have a condition where you have maxed out that centrifugal. It is running at full load, 100% RLA, and it can't achieve set point. Thankfully, you've got two more chillers in that plant. And they're all tied in, however they're tied in, whether it be a common header, whether it be a, a primary loops, however they're tied into each other. Doesn't matter. You need more chiller. Okay. At this point, uh, this is where a, it doesn't have to be automation. Uh, our, our chillers today have the ability to do this and communicate to each other directly. And uh, even some of the older machines have the function to where they can run together uh, through a um, uh, just through their own communication. Now we're not talking brand to brand. We're talking you know, if they had 
a set of trains on site or a set of Yorks on site. These machines can work together to run in place of an automation. Most plants, though, have some form of an automation. And so the automation is going to be looking at, okay, this compressor, this chiller is running uh, at maximum. It won't stage up any further, and I cannot achieve my leaving water set point. So we'll go back to the same uh, essential numbers. We have 55 coming in, and let's say we're putting 50 degrees out. So that one chiller by itself is only able to cool the water five degrees. So we need to bring in a second one to get that other five. That plant is going to give, uh, it's, there's a couple of ways automation does it. If the automation is actually back netted into the chiller and controlling it that way, and it's able to see you know, the exact condition that chiller is in. But most of the time, what automation is going to do is they're going to say, okay, chiller, you've got 30 minutes to achieve set point. And if I don't see you achieve set point in 30 minutes, I'm going to bring on number two. And typically, if everything's working properly and you don't have an extremely high load, uh, that chiller's should be able to hit set point within that 30 minute window. Okay. Uh, but let's say that hasn't happened. All right. 30 minutes has expired. I still do not see my leaving water set point for the building. Chiller two, you're coming on. It's going to open. Well, it's either going to open isolation valves and allow that chiller to come in, or it's going to, you know, say it doesn't have, say it's a primary pumps and it's going to turn the, pump on for the next chiller, uh, which a lot of times, you know, I see them use the check valves as the, um, the check valve at the pump to stop flow on the primary, which I'm not a fan of. I, my personal recommendation is each chiller should have its own ISO valves that don't rely on the pump check valve. Regardless, it's a conversation for another day. Um, so the pump turns on, on chiller two, chiller two comes in. And it's going to stage up. Chiller 2 and Chiller 1 have no cares about each other in a centrifugal situation. Uh, you know, uh, whereas, so earlier with a screw chiller, uh, the two circuits unload when the other circuit needs to come in to run two circuits together, right? So the first one that already loaded up is going to unload so that it can come to a minimum and both of them can stage together from there. With, this, uh, with a, a centrifugal, the automation isn't going to do anything to cause chiller one to unload. It's strictly going to turn on chiller two and chiller two is going to load up. And this is going to, this chiller two will then load up until it can hit set point. And even if that happens with that chiller at 80%, so okay, let's say chiller one is running 100% RLA. Chiller two is running 80% RLA. And we've now hit set point. Naturally, over time, these two are going to find each other. And they will settle out, say, to keep it simple, a 90% RLA median. And then the two of them, because they're both trying to achieve the same thing, are going to stage down together until they are overcooling. And so then the automation is going to say, okay, I want a 45, the two of you are giving me 44. You're giving me too much cold water. You've done this for more than 30 minutes. I'm not okay with that. Chiller two, you're turning off. Chiller one, it's all you now. And then chiller one, because the water temp's gonna go up, because now we only have one chiller, is gonna then stage back up and find its happy point, and it's just gonna cruise along until it's done. Now, in the same way that I spoke earlier about you wanna minimize cycling chiller two just cycled keep that in mind and it's not something we want to have happen it may it might be necessary but we don't want it to happen if we can prevent it and that goes back to the plant and the commission and there's a, a whole rabbit trail there uh, question so are the tubes normally rifled or smooth bore 
They will be rifled. I don't know that a machine has been made in the last 20 years that hasn't, this didn't have rifling or some kind of um, raised texture in, internally. So it, it's, they it want to, wants to force a turbulence. So by creating a rifling, we're creating turbulence. That's one thing. Then two, if we have raised edges, um, you know, they will literally uh, uh, press that into the copper the, that all that surface area, every little dip and valley and everything that's in there creates more surface area for more heat exchange. So we're, we want, we're creating a spiraling turbulence through there. At the same time, we have dips and waves and things internally. Now we're talking on a minuscule scale. We're not saying you're going to hold this thing up and see the pipe doing this. It's the pipe is still going to be straight, but if you look down through it and see down the barrel of it, um, you'll see that it looks textured. That texturing, along with the rifling, is the surface area to create the most efficient heat exchange possible. One thing I'll also touch on in terms of loading and unloading. The exact same principles apply if you have an air-cooled screw machine or scroll machine and it has an automation system and there's three chillers in that plant uh, if chiller one stages up and cannot achieve set point in 30 minutes just like the centrifugals the air cools will stage up the exact same way um, at the same time you also have uh, lead lags so that is technically a lead lag operation. You know, it can't achieve set points. It's going to bring the other one in. That's the most efficient way to do it. It is not as efficient to do a balanced load in a plant like that. It's, it's it, because you're talking either, either more pumps or more condenser fans. You know, more components have to operate, which draws more total power if you do a balanced load. And when I say balanced load, I mean that every – circuit and machine is balancing the staging across all of them instead of focusing it in on one at a time. So that is where, you know, a balanced load on a scroll might make a little more sense than a screw. Uh, not that it never makes sense for screws, but it, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. Uh, any questions so far I, before I get too much further down my things doing pretty good on time honestly doing a lot better than I expected to any questions I'm going to take a second just catch anybody that's got any Okay, this is good. If there's no questions, that means that I'm hoping it makes sense. Um, shoot, guys. Okay, so pull down. All right, let's talk about pull down. Um, in a pull down situation you're talking about typically at startup that's that's when we see you know pull downs in a it's specifically a commercial sense uh, you can go into pull down cycles during a, a more industrial application when different machinery or different loads or tests or whatever is happening in that plant they fire up you can have massive loads come in hit the built or hit the loop and we have to go into pull downs to to get that under control right uh, Anyway, in a commercial sense, it's usually at startup. The machine has, has been off for whatever period of time. This may be early, uh, startup in the morning. You know, we were, we've been off overnight, haven't ran for eight hours. The loop, everything else has come to ambient conditions. Uh, now we need to pull it back down. Why pull downs are important is two reasons. 
Uh, one, it can save you efficiency. So you have a drawn out, more consistent pull down. It's not a rapid cliff dive coming down to set point, uh, which gives you better efficiency and lets the building and the whole system just kind of ease into its operating status, which is good for the building as a whole. Everything's not trying to fly at 100 miles an hour. Now, the second thing is you can actually force your equipment into a trip. So for example, uh, more heat being added at a faster rate leads to higher head pressures. And sometimes you can literally overload your condenser, whether that be air cooled or water cooled. So if, if you have a, uh, a set point or a safety trip, We'll use a centrifugal as an example. You have a safety trip of 105% RLA. If you exceed 105%, uh, then your, your machine's going to shut down on uh, a high current, right? Um, so if our current limit is 100% at startup, and we have a really high load. So let's say, when I say a high load, we, we turn on, we got 70 degrees coming into this chiller. Even if our condenser water stays reasonable and it doesn't take a spike because of the excessive load, you're running so close with a unstable load. So a high load like that is considered unstable. It has a lot of fluctuations as the water and everything circulates and cycles and does its thing and equalizes, um, you're going to have swings. You're going to have dramatic swings. And every time that swing happens, that's fluctuating the pressures on your vessels, uh, trying to catch it. And that's why, you know, doing a pull down, it gradually eases all this in and it, it takes some of that swing out of it. And it's not so dramatic. So, uh, if you didn't have the pull down and you are allowed the machine to ramp to 100% RLA, okay, uh, then you're talking a 5% RLA variance before you're shutting down on safety with a very unstable load. That's not hard to do. And that's usually what happens. It's going to cycle off on an overcurrent, not because anything's wrong. It just doesn't have a pull down programmed versus you go in and you enable a pull down say of 30 minutes at startup and it's gonna uh, prevent the compressor from loading beyond whether it be 60 percent 80 percent you decide for your situation right uh let's say we'll, we'll use uh, 80 percent as our example now we go from five percent to 25 percent rla of uh uh, of, of variance from our trip point. So our, our likelihood of tripping on safety dramatically reduces, uh, which, which stops nuisance alarms for the building that, should have, that didn't have to happen. At the same time, we even out that loading. And that is a pull down at its core. And so once we, uh, typically a lot of times they'll be timed so you're going to set a timer for, I want you to pull down for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, RLA X for your set point during that time. And once the pull down uh, timer expires, or once you get so close to set point, depending on your machine and how it's set up, and there's a hundred configurations for this. Um, anyway, depending on, on your setup, uh, once it exceeds the pull down parameter, then it's going to go to your default current limit, whether that's 100% or not. So if your pull down is 60% and you never want your machine to load past 80, so your normal operating mode is 80% RLA, well, then you're going to run at 60% until after the pull down, and then you're going to switch back over automatically to 80%. You don't have to touch a thing. So when you first turn a machine on, um, 
whether it most of the time they'll tell you in pull down state or something to that degree, right? They usually give you some kind of indication. Even if it doesn't, or you say you don't notice it, or you don't know how to find where it says that. Uh, if it's taking a really long time and it's only loading up so far and then stopping, I just understand you're in a pull down. Once it achieves whatever it's looking for, whether it be time or temperature, uh, it will come back out of that pull down. Uh, on a pull down with current limiter, be changed by the chiller or like, okay, yeah. Um, since we have a little time, let's talk reset. So with a chill water reset, uh, that means that the, the chill water set point is going to change if our entering water, uh, yeah, we'll start with that one. If our entering water gets below a certain value, for example, if we have a 45 degree set point year round, but we have a reset programmed to where if the entering water gets below 48 degrees or gets to 48 degrees, uh, then we can reset the set point to let's say 50 degrees. So we go, we're going to change this, the chill water leaving set point by five degrees and it's going to run the chill water loop now at 50 degrees until you get back above a certain entering water temperature. Now, for the sake of simplicity, that could mean uh, a 10 degrees offset from set point. So uh, in that case, you know, if we reset to 50, then if we got back to 60 degrees entering, then the uh, we would kick out of a reset and back into normal set point to 45 and then we're going to pull the loop back down uh, so that's one way to do it the other way is based off of outside air temperature this would typically be done through the automation system some chillers can do it internally on their controls so you're going to um, if your outside air gets below a set value, say 55 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to reset your uh, chill waters uh, on the loop to, uh, you know, from 45 to 50. And then once you get back above, say, 60 degrees outside, then you're going to reset back down to the 45. Now, typically, these will have uh, time delays on them, and you want them to. Uh, so, you know, it may be a 30 minute, that's a very common delay for the, for once for cycling modes like that. Uh, it may have a 30 minute delay so that if it gets, a, you know, below that temperature or above, it's not going to change modes until it's been in that state consistently without changing for 30 minutes. Most of the time, if it gets to minute 29, and it drops one tenth of a degree below that set point, that timer restarts, usually. Um, uh, so uh, with a reset, uh, my personal recommendation is base it off of entering water. I think you're gonna get the most consistent results that way. And it's gonna, you're, you're actually paying attention to the building load because building load should be relative to uh, the entering water on the machine if the building is balanced properly. There's a lot of buildings that aren't. A lot of times they flow too much water, you know, when they're, because that's what people, that's a very uh, natural thing to do is when you're having trouble with the machine running properly, you want to open and provide more flow to achieve better cooling effect or whatever else. That is a natural instinct for a technician or a building engineer or anybody, but that is not the wise thing to do. And so you have that happen over 10, 20, 30 years and the entire building gets out of calibration. And now uh, you've got, a, a loop that can't 
provide, it can't maintain a high enough entering water to properly tend to the, to the equipment because it's flowing too much water because the entire system has basically been opened up nearly wide open. Just it has way too much GPM. Need to back it off. Um, so anyway, I, I recommend using entering water as your reset point. And if you're going to do it, you know, do them both. Use outside air as a lockout. So if you get below this certain temperature, it's going to shut that machine down and not let it run. But have it to where it, if it's somewhere between X and Y, it'll reset the, the set point, which is going to save you efficiency. It's going to, it's going to dramatically reduce the, the, uh, the operating cost of that machine when it's able to run like that. Uh, and ultimately, you know, just what, deci what decides efficiency is compression ratio. Compression ratio is directly tied to amps because it's all tied into horsepower and how much force is required to maintain X amount of refrigerant flow. So the lower you can maintain within reason, there is too low, but the lower you can maintain your compression ratio in a general sense, the more efficient the system is going to run. So compression ratio is factored by the difference at atmospheric pressure, not gauge, calculating your atmospheric pressure, uh, and then dividing those two into each other, that's going to give you a, um, uh, that's going to give you your compression ratio. You know, whether it be 1.3, 1.6, 2.0, 3.0, you know, the higher that value, the harder your compressor is having to work and the more energy it's using. So uh, if the pressures are what's relevant there, then the lower we can run our head pressure and the higher we can run our evaporator, the closer we can make those to each other, the lower the ratio. So the reset makes sense at that point because one, we've, we've typically... We already have a low load condition outside. So we're not having to make the condenser work as hard to begin with. Um, and then we can take that even further by resetting our chill water to where it doesn't have to work as hard to maintain um, a, uh, a lower, because the you know, lower water temperature, because you gotta think a dramatic amount of energy is required per every degree colder you want to make that water. That's why unless your building is absolutely necessary to run at like a 42 degree water loop, if that's not required, which some buildings are, don't. Because if you can maintain at 45, you will get more efficiency and less, less energy usage out of that entire system. Uh, and that is reset in a nutshell. Uh, again, all of this is just meant to be a recap. We've talked about a bunch of this last couple of months. My point for tonight is to hone in on the very common things and let you hear it a second time in a more focused manner. So I'm not trying to cover the whole stinking chiller this time. I'm, I'm trying to be a lot more focused with the general concept, because that's what I want you to walk away with right now is a concept of what it is we're doing and why. And you can then take that concept and start applying it to the different machines and their nuances to then come to a conclusion on how it's running and whether it's running properly. Uh, tomorrow night, we will be start, we will do a class over interfaces. We're going to be talking about, um, uh, different equipment from RTU to chiller interfaces, you know, how to turn it on, how to make it stop, what are some things to be careful with, uh, how to navigate some of those things. Um, I've even got a simulator that I can pull up for some like York equipment 
and I can show uh, on the simulator what it's going to look like when you do certain things. Um, so that's going to be tomorrow night. Other than that, final questions. Uh, now is your chance to get them in. Otherwise, we're going to clock out. I'm going to go home. My wife and kiddos are patiently waiting. Any final questions? Send them through. Send them through. Now's your chance. Otherwise, time to go spend some time with the family. Give you all just a couple of minutes. Uh, for those who are not APS employees, their performance of Central Texas. Uh, this this class is for our people. Um, you know, y'all have the benefit of the platform and just it's really convenient to do it this way. So uh, we are hiring. We are looking for people. If anybody's interested, apply. We are very particular. You know, we, we, we vet our candidates fairly heavily. So uh, I just want you to understand that going into it. We have a very talented team and that's how we keep it that way is by getting the right people. So uh, we do have positions from apprentice though. You know, if you've got any schooling background or if you've gotten your degree in this from apprentice up through to more senior level guys. So um, just uh, go to, you can go to our website, uh, APS-CentralTX.com. I think there's like slash join our, join us or something. Anyway, you can just go to our website. You can see uh, um, how to apply, submit your application or your resume. We can go from there. We'll be reaching out. Um, so yeah, if you want to be a part of this, whether it be in person or uh, you know they've got direct access, they're texting their questions to me as we're going through the class. Uh, Jason. Um, is actually one of the guys that had moved here and he's been very active in the chat. Really appreciate him. Uh, he's, he is a example of, you know, what we're trying to do in this industry and trying to reach and help others, um, at the same time, just develop it. So just understand that, you know, we are trying to take care of our own people, but at the same time being generous with the training provided, which, making this an open, open forum, open source, open questions. Um, loss of subcooler liquid seal. So ultimately that just means your, uh, liquid level in the condenser has gotten too low. That is something you'll see on a York machine that has a subcooler, uh, circuit. And so when your liquid level is able to get too low, uh, it's, it's, Detecting your subcooling and it's trying to prevent uh, non subcooled refrigerant being able to get to the metering device. So, be, being a York, you want to make sure that you're looking at your liquid level. You have a sight glass, you have a sensor, those sensors do go bad. Uh, you can see the liquid level um, uh, or the subcooler uh, uh, assembly through that sight glass and the condenser. So, that big stainless steel looking metal thing inside that glass. Uh, that is your subcooler plates. The liquid level on that machine should be three quarters to one inch above that stainless steel assembly. When you look through there, if it is not, then something is wrong, whether it be a charge issue or a flow. Um, and that is how, you know, those machines control liquid is through the liquid level sensor. So, there, there's not really much of anything in the evaporator. Um, it can, I say that, it can have sensors in the evaporator, but most of the time, and at least in our situations, they don't. So we're strictly basing it off of uh, your condenser liquid level on the machine's flow. And we're trying to maintain a set, set point there. That set point will be found in the condenser menu under liquid level control on that OptiView control panel. Anyway, good night. See y'all later. MTT, spend your time. See how long this thing takes to...